Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the first talk of this year's Art at Said um, Business Talks program. Um, I'm delighted to welcome today our speakers, Alex Heath and Dr. Craig Knight. Thank you both very much for travelling all this way to, to be with us today. Um, the topic today is um, Making Art Work in the Workplace, which is also the title, I might add, of um, Alex's little booklet that you may have seen, which I think you both worked on, is that right? Oh no, this is this is yours, um, which you are very welcome to, to pick up and take away with you. There are some outside. Um, and actually, it's really relevant to what we're doing at the Saeed Business School Art Programme. You know, everything I think, well, I, I hope that we're going to talk about today um, will hopefully resonate with, you know, why we are running this programme and why we have art at Saeed. So um, first of all, I'd like to welcome Alex. Thank you very much. There we go. So before, actually, before we get going, I'd just like to mention Dr. Craig Knight, who I'll be referring to, who's going to be following on, talking about productivity and uh, art in the workplace in a, in a very more scientific way. But uh, so Craig's over there as well. Um, can I ask a question, just a quick question first, just about the audience. Um, how many of you are business students? OK, so the two thirds, I'd say, if that's right. And how many of you are here just because you're interested in art generally? Okay, okay, that's good. That's good. It's a good crossover there if we do our pie charts or Venn diagrams. Um, good. Well, that's given us a clue, hasn't it, Craig? Right. Um, so I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes, and, uh, and Craig, likewise, to give us some time for some questions. That's correct? Yes? Um, so this, is, this document was produced a, a while back now. In fact, we do it every 10 years, and I think we're into year eight of this particular document. And this is a piece of research that we did with the British Council of Offices. Uh, who are kind of probably the purveyors of best practice in the workplace in terms of design, specifications, best practice of, of, of fitting out offices. And uh, we did some work with them. So uh, just briefly, I'm going to talk about us, what the research was about, some of the findings and some best practice, but get through that quite quickly to allow time to hear from Craig as well. Um, so who are we? Well, we've been around actually since 1978 originally. Uh, and we're really specialists in working with the corporate uh, environment to try and help them in terms of putting art into the workplace, uh, specifying art, doing art strategies, branding strategies, but basically deploying art in all these different areas of the in, uh, work environment. Uh, we've been opened up, we have offices in Paris where we share a gallery space with Herman Miller, who are big office furniture players. Uh, and we have various times had offices in Dubai and Boston, uh, and we have affiliates all over the place who work with us quite actively. And we have, as you can see, some pretty demanding clients. Um, some of our biggest clients like likes of Barclays, Allen and Overy. Um, and really, you know, we, we, you know, they basically tell us to jump. We just say, how high, generally. Um, so the, the, the research that we did was to, first to check, because we did a piece of research. As I say, we'd done it in 1990. We did another one in 2000. So we periodically do these research pieces as part of our practice. But we, it's good to check you know, how much is artwork being deployed in the workplace, actually get some stats around that. You know, why are people doing it? What are the benefits? How are they are shifting? What are people, what, what onus are people putting on art? How office design is changing? Of course, there have been radical changes in office design over the last 10, 15 years as well, which has really impacted, um, um, impacted our work. Um, and then to try and tie that into behavioral research is where, where Dr. Knight comes in, and, we'll, and we'll, I'll be probably won't go into too deeply in mind to allow time for, for Craig to do that later. Um, and then actually art's changing, of course. The whole digital LEDs, digital art, the whole the, what one can do cost effectively in the workplace is changing as well. And as a result of all of that, back of this brochure, give it to our clients and everyone else, you know, how's best practice changing you know, in terms of deploying art in the workplace? Um, so do pick a copy up later if, if it's of interest. Um, so. Without further ado, so we did a questionnaire to the BCO membership, 1,500 members. This is the last research piece we did. 7% response rate, you can do the math. Not an enormous number of people for quantitative, but enough to give a statistically significant sample and allow us to dig a bit deeper with those respondents. And then we did a whole series of qualitative research, interviewing specialists in all the different areas of workplace design, um, our clients as well as other, as well as other specialists, including uh, 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 Craig. Um, so just to go through some of the key findings, um, you know, not surprisingly, 90% uh, 
of people said, yes, we do have art in the workplace. Uh, the other 10% must be a bit dire, but uh, that uh, we were pleased to see that. And then actually, uh, the, the, majority, the vast majority of them said, actually, it, it, art is a really important part of what we try and do in the workplace today. It's more relevant than ever. Um, so um, I'll go through all these points, basically, in terms of the benefits, the challenges facing art, how you deploy it, some of the affordability factors, and best practice. So a rather traditional graph there in terms of the questionnaire results. You'd have seen that in, in the business environment. But you can see some of the, the data there, which I'll just go through. So 94% of the respondents agreed the art makes the workplace more welcoming. Um, and it does act as a catalyst effect. It's something to talk about. Uh, an example, this was a, a foyer that was empty, a kind of big marble atrium uh, in the Strand, um, or High Holborn, just coming, actually High Holborn, not the Strand, so next one up, other side of Lincoln Infield. And they basically had this kind of cavernous, unwelcoming area. We commissioned a couple of young artists to create this mosaic of felt balls that actually reflects Lincoln's Infield, which is the garden space behind. It became a major feature. People would sit down and kind of ping, ping the felt balls and they had to kind of put lots of replacement balls in a box, reception. Um, and uh, and it, created a, it really did create quite a vibe and quite a lot of PR around that space. So the developer was delighted, turned, turned something from a liability into an asset. 28% um, of the respondents say that art makes feel, feel more valued. And I think this is a key, key point, which is that nowadays, a lot of people hiring, um, investing enormous amounts of people in office space and in their staff, be it, account be it accountants, lawyers, um, are basically competing with broadband as it is now. They're competing with the local Starbucks. They're competing with um, people working, wanting to work from home because they can. So if you're going to invest thousands or millions into your workspace, big HQ for a bunch of graduates, you want them to come in. So, you know, Andy Mosley, head, head, or did, he's, I think he's, he's not heading that role now, head of workplace at KPMG, a massive employer, they're saying, look, you know, art's about retention. We want people to come into work because the space is stimulating, it's a good environment, and, it's, and people's expectations are, are being raised all the time. Um, creativity, actually, there are, you know, 61% of respondents said that art make people more creative. Art makes people more creative. And in fact, if you, are, if you are presented with or have something nearby that is actually stimulating and genuinely um, aesthetic as opposed to anesthetic, it really can actually help you in terms of the way you respond and the way you actually um, uh, generate ideas. 11% um, said that art makes staff more productive. So here is where you know, there's been some really interesting research done. I'm not going to steal... Craig's Thunder, um, but essentially there's been some, you know, for us it's great. It's the, the work that he's been doing has been fantastic over the years because to have someone scientifically um, researching how putting art and other related um, benefits, such as, you know, it might be plants, but uh, putting art into a space um, and allowing the employees to actually work with that and choose it and select it um, can actually, depending on the level of interaction, can actually allow... Um, productivity benefits to be measured. So you can actually, so for us as art consultants, trying to persuade more companies to put art into their environment, uh, to actually be able to put a business case together saying actually if you put art into your environment, and even better if you put art into your environment and allow your employees to be involved in the selection and placing of that art and rotation of that art, you can actually get a demonstrable productivity benefit and a business case that makes our life a lot easier when we're up against some tough CEO and say why should I spend a penny on art? So you're going to hear a lot more from Craig later. So in terms of just an example of that, this is a this is Barclay Card uh, trying to do some. We did some really kind of novel kind of offices for them, which was a lot of kind of comfy sofas and kitchen areas and dressers and bits and pieces and knickknacks, and allowed people to organise it themselves. And uh, the, the the this was a 30 floor building in Canary Wharf. This was the floor that we did as a pilot, which was kind of homely you know, big old oak kitchen tables. Um, and, uh, and this was the most, basically they had to put a kind of lock and key arrangement on this floor because all the other 29 floors wanted to work here. So it's a kind of prototype kind of we work environment, um, which shows that if you allow, you know, people to put what they want, create something that's homely. These were little, um, sorry, I'll go back. 
these were little pieces done with Barclay cards that we put into the shelves or they put where they wanted and it really, really created a huge demand for that space. Um, art and branding and you know, be internal branding, external branding, absolutely critical. Um, and, you know, 75, three quarters of the respondents said that art communicates corporate values. If I just spotted the screen over there, so I don't need to keep looking behind me. So uh, better late than never. Um, and uh, although I can't stop myself doing that. So, um, so basically, and a lot of the work we do is, is around branding as well, because it, it's, art has become, you know, be it Deutsche Bank, be it some of the other private banks, um, everyone has spotted that if you can create an affinity with an audience that likes art, it's definitely going to help you in your, in your marketing. So here is a, here's a piece um, that uh, we did with Pringle Brandon, who are leading interior architects. And Fidesa is a, is a software company, I believe, if I recall, financial software. But they had this lovely big atrium with a big staircase, and what they wanted was to create something that was a bit special around the brand, and that's the kind of color scheme and branding. So we commissioned uh, an amazing um, glass artist called Amy Cushing, and she created this suspended piece with hand kiln formed glass pieces, and it just ripples gently in the air conditioning, and everybody was absolutely amazed. And it became a major feature for the company, not a big company, but they thought this was a really important part of their branding. Um, I mentioned Barclay Card. So here we actually commissioned a guy to do these little pieces. These are really small pieces. You saw them sitting in the shelf earlier. So little tiny little things which are aspirational lifestyle pieces, uh, which are all made out of Barclay Cards, little kind of streets, hang gliders. And absolutely, clients absolutely loved it. And these things, again, were, uh, you know, jumped off the shelves from the, from the staff, really wanted these in their offices and in their breakout areas. Um, that's just another piece which I won't dwell on, Evercore, Pringle Brand, and again, which is about the, the map and the globe, because they're a kind of global player, a bit more obvious in a sense, but again, very well received. Um, and so, um, as I said, branding is important. Um, I'm trying to get through this relatively quickly so we have time for questions. But the benefit side of this, it's got trickier. You know, we, I've been an art consultant now for 15 years with international art consultants. <laughs> and, you know, things have changed a lot in terms of, in terms of the interior space. So, you know, when we first started, you know, I inherited a business that basically you put in, you had lots and lots of cubicle offices, with lots of white walls, lots of corridors with white walls. And you put up, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of framed pictures. That was what we did, day in, day out. That's all changed now in terms of the way offices are structured. Um, also, you guys and our clients are much more aware of art. Art has become much more embedded in the day-to-day -day consciousness. Contemporary art's become a big thing. The whole Tate modern phenomenon over our generation or my generation has meant that contemporary art is much more pervasive, and knowledge of art is much more pervasive. And creating a wow factor that actually creates some differentiation from your clients has got more difficult. Um, and basically, we've also learned that getting people involved is really, really important. And at the same time, we've been through a few big economic cycles where actually people have been quite reluctant to spend lots of money on art as well. So we've got to be quite creative about how we get that done. Um, so workplace design, again, Craig's going to talk a bit more about that. Um, but that's changed. It's, it's, it's basically to say that... Uh, the guy who, uh, who runs a 10 million, or did run a 10 million euro art budget at Deutsche Bank per annum, uh, he was still finding it difficult to find places to put all his art because there was a lot more glass and a lot less corridors. Um, and there's a lot more flexibility in the workplace now in terms of, you know, people don't have fixed offices. Well, some do, but the majority of people now work in open plan environments. They work in flexible environments, which get basically changed re regularly. Um, and those of you go, those of you going into the workforce or been in the workforce recently will have experienced the whole kind of Regis, WeWork, office group experience where, you know, basically the whole way that offices are configured has changed uh, with hot desking and common spaces and the whole kind of lounge way of working. Um, so the art really has to reflect that. You need something that's flexible, can be moved, can be installed, can be rented, rotated, uh, rather than these big kind of monolithic installations or collections that stay there for a decade, you know. Um, so some examples. So here's a, a, a Lend Lease, big property company. Um, this, is a, this is one of their kind of breakout food areas, which can be a meeting area, somewhere they eat, somewhere the staff can cook themselves. Sometimes they have breakout, kind of they get do entertainment there. So we, we basically 
commissioned Kate Maestri, who's a wonderful glass artist, to do the whole back wall, reflects um, some of the kind of logos and, and uh, color schemes of the, of the company, but also it had to be wipe free, you know, so it's glass and it's kind of functional as well. Um, slightly dull picture here, slightly better on that screen. But uh, this is, uh, again, a private equity company. We were given a horrendous foyer, uh, and they wanted to use it for breakout and reception, and it was very echoey, so we commissioned a textile artist here. And so this has actually got functional benefits as well. So again, the art's doing something other than just art. It's, this is creating something that creates a better soundscape uh, and less echo. Um, so the wow factor, I said it's much more difficult to get a wow factor now um, than it used to be. Um, and in fact, in the survey we did, you know, 11% um, of people said they had some kind of dynamic or kinetic artwork, yet those that had it said it did make a big impact. So clearly an area where you can get more value, more impact from your art is if you make it a bit more dynamic. As the head of Paul Scriven, a very, very well-respected uh, creative director at a big architecture firm, he said, you know, it's really important these days to turn something that's necessary into something that's special. And that's what a lot of architects are doing with their budgets as well, to try and combine design with something that's exciting as well. So we were one of the first to commission a uh, major, this is, we did three atriums. There's a big lawyer in the city of London called Alan Avery, one of the biggest lawyers in London, built at Norman Foster, big new Norman Foster building, went up in Spitalfields. Three massive atriums that were kind of dark cubes within the building. And we were probably the first people to commission a digital light array that was dynamic, so when the dawn, when dawn breaks, it does one thing. If there's a storm, it does other things. And uh, again, it was, very, it was a very popular piece with the staff that had offices bordering that atrium. Uh, it's become more commonplace now. Cost is coming down, uh, probably by a factor of, to do that now would probably cost five times less, a fifth of what it cost us to do uh, uh, then. So the whole LED technology, uh, the ability of the, the software programmers to do what they need to do means that there's a whole plethora of digital studios now that can do amazing work that's much more affordable and you know we can go out to clients and with a fairly modest budget can do something quite special whereas before it needed an Allen Overy or a Barclays to commission this. So another little example, again, I haven't got the, embedded the video in, the, in this, but that's another piece we did for Barclay Card in a big open plan area, and basically it's made completely out of Barclay Cards, and it just kind of ripples like a wave backwards and forwards. Um, and again, it kind of animates one whole area of a big, big open plan office, and again, a, a very popular piece. Uh, this, again, this actually needs the animation, but it's, a, it's a, a building society, and each day there are lots and lots of little digital people that kind of come out in the morning and, and spread themselves out and they might say hello or they might give you the temperature or don't worry or whatever else. So, and they just have a life of their own. And it's just, the, and, uh, and what we do is we curate this. So every three to six months, we'll add another whole animation. So they'll get a bit bored of it after a while and then something else will happen. Um, so I'm going to probably not well large on this because it's getting into Craig's area. So um, the academic research about the productivity game is really what Craig's going to talk about in a minute. Um, but you know, there's a lot of practical examples of, of the Bennett we've been saying for a long time without the scientific research that you'll get a lot more out of your art programs if you let your staff get involved. So if you know, just presenting art and saying, right, that's what you're having uh, is a lot less effective in terms of motivation, retention, inspiration and saying, okay guys, we're moving into a new building. Can we get you involved in what you'd like to have there? What kind of themes would you like to develop? How would you set up an art committee, get people involved? <laughs> um, and if even better, if you've got a huge selection of artwork, let your staff choose. So Deutsche Bank have a massive art collection and they allow people to select. So there's a team that will take art and rotate it and put you stuff from the catalog in your office, change it out if you want it changed out. And people love that. They love having a the ability to have a kind of art collection brought to them. Um, and uh, what other pictures have I got here? So some of the key areas there is, you know, ask your guys what they want. Um, let them get involved, so it's not like by fiat. Um, so we, secret of course, is to have it in an art committee to make sure it's an odd number, so you can get a vote. Um, artists talked, if you do invest in art, get the artists in to talk about the art. You know, actually get them to talk about how this was created 
If it's local, Oxford, you'd be able to do that. Obviously, in London, it's easy. Take your people out to the artist studios so they can actually see people at work. Have a go. We've organized some ceramic workshops, which is great. Sometimes get collaborations going with the firm that you're working with. Um, and actually, last but not least, if it's done well, get your staff to get involved. There are a lot of creative people in these bigger firms, you know, and it's very easy to organize a photography competition or something, so actually start bringing some of that creativity in. So, a couple of examples. Um, this one was um, with Moody's. Moody's was a, who knows Moody's? Moody's is a credit company. Great stuff, so you know Moody's. So Moody's spend their life um, analyzing stuff to actually look at the credit worthiness of companies, whether their balance sheets are strong, whether, of course I'm at a business school, you know all this, um, whether they're gonna go bust or not. Um, and they move from a really dull office into a really nice office in Canary Wharf, it's kind of spick and span, and they basically said to us, look, well, how, do we, how do we do this? What can we do to bring art into this, into this big kind of Canary Wharf office? So we basically did some surveys, we, we got a group together, and we ended up with a theme which was called Making Sense of What You See. So to try and, they spend their life decoding annual report and accounts, financial reports, and so what we did is we selected a body of work which actually required people to look at it quite carefully and decode what was going on in the work. You can probably see one in this, which is the, um, a whole series of people by Rob and Nick Carter, which are these really dynamic ph photographic pieces. You have to work out what's going on. But there are other lovely pieces. Susan Durgis does these um, moonlit um, pieces where she puts a ph photographic paper in the water at night, and then it kind of creates images over time. You have to kind of look at that quite carefully and work out what's going on. So the whole thing there was getting the staff to get involved and work out what these pieces were. And that became a huge success, and they've rolled it out across the world in terms of a theme. But we also involved the staff with photography competitions and art competitions, and all the cafeterias around the world have the staff art on the wall regularly, and it's curated carefully, so it doesn't look terrible. You know, So I, I could go on for hours, and I won't. So, um, but it works really well, and, it, and that combination of of interesting work and getting people involved is very strong. I think this is probably almost last piece. How long have I been going on for? 20 minutes already? Yeah, probably. Um, so um, this just is another example of getting staff involved. Global headquarters, the whole world were asked to contribute in terms of the whole world of Alan and Overy, um, what the law meant to them. So they all contributed quotes about you know, why were they lawyers, you know, what did it mean to them to be involved in justice in multiple languages, multiple scripts, and that was then commissioned to these big glass uh, strips that went down some of the key areas in, around the firm, and that, again, became very important to the staff. Um, you've got to make a, a lot, since the, the Great Recession in eight, nine, ten. budgets have been quite constrained compared to the good old days in early 2000s, and then Brexit's also. Um, put a bit of a cap on corporate spending on art in the last two or three years. So a lot of the clients are having to do more with less. So it's important to bring in contemporary artists. This is a selection of graduate artists. You know, do something like you might do at home. So put lots of prints up. So there's lots of ways of deploying art that doesn't have to be multi, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds. It can be very limited budget. So I think that's probably it from me. As I say, this is, there's a lot of that in here if you're actually interested in going into some of the detail. Um, and some of the best practice there, which I would say to our client base, is uh, you know, self-explanatory there, but make sure you get a budget as well. Um, and that's, that's me on the corporate art side. But I'm going to hand you over now to Craig, who's been doing some great work in terms of, for me at least, justifying why it's worth uh, making your office a nicer place. Thanks. <laughs> Grab the clicker if I'm there. He may. Thank you very much. What we're going to look at in 20 minutes is how the workplace has developed, how things like arts have a really important effect on how we feel at work. Has anybody in this room not had experience of a workplace outside of a student experience? Anybody not? Really? Good. Right. Let's start. This is what we're going to look at quickly, a quick overview, where the world is, where it's going, some research. So how do we get where we are then? How did we get to the site of office that we have at the moment? This is San Francisco Bay Trading Company in 1864. And 
to send your son, and in 1864, 99.6% of all white-collar workers were male, to send your son to be a clerk was to set him above the most skilled artisans in the country. Clerks were coffers of information. And what you can see here is a customer in a top hat wandering in and a whole series of clerks that are there to greet him, meet him and sell to him and open an account and run an account and do the files in the account. When it comes to it, close the account. We move forward to pairs in London. A few years later, the same thing is going on. We still have clerks, but you'll see a chap there in the goldfish bowl. And he's getting interested in what those clerks are doing. Because the guy in America called Frederick Taylor who's splitting up complicated steel production into individual units of production and increasing productivity by 800%. So that, for example, instead of one team taking the iron from the, from the railway, taking it through the steel mill and producing the whole thing, they're splitting it down into simple components so that one person is responsible solely for taking pig iron from a train and putting it onto a bogey that goes into the steel mill. And that person, quote, needs to be as strong as an ox, as phlegmatic as an ox, and as stupid as an ox. Those were the hiring requirements to do that job. And offices were getting very interested. Now, remember the demographic, 99.6% male. There's a teensy-weensy change going on here. This is Sears in Chicago. And what's happened is the office job, the clerical job, has been split into simple units of production like filing, like typing, like sales, like marketing, into simple jobs that people can control. And because we now understand what's going on in this particular typing office, where we have unmarried women solely doing that job, because they're cheap, they're biddable, they have the skills, and you can get rid of them when you need to, so when they get married or get pregnant, they can go. Because we know what to do, we can employ slightly older married women there, unmarried women to walk amongst the people and make sure people are paying attention and not drifting off. And because it's relatively cheap, we can get one over that side as well. We can have a couple, have one in the middle, and let's have a few. Huh? You know, we can then make sure that people aren't going to the lavatory too much, not talking to the neighbours, and generally getting on with the job. There's one man in that photograph. There he is. And that man knows precisely what's going on. He takes what we call the helicopter view. He knows what goes on. His boss takes the helicopter view of the whole building rather than the floor, and more than likely his boss takes the view of the whole company. And we have this tailorist, high surveillance, low autonomy structure. Now, we're quite interested as psychologists in how this looks, because we then see something coming through that hasn't changed that much, but we find is adding to what's going on in the workplace. We find this thing called the panopticon that you may have heard of. The panopticon is a prison developed by philosopher Jeremy Bentham. And essentially, you have one central tower, which will be the central tower. And from that central tower, you can look out into any of the concentric cells through obscure glass. There's obscure glass missing from there, John told us Philadelphia State, or was. And so imagine there's obscure glass. So I can look out into any one of the concentric cells and make sure that people are behaving. And if there are two people, if there are two guards, and clearly you can get twice, four times as many. But if there are no guards, madam, you still have to behave, because you don't know whether you're being watched or not. So Foucault called it the perfect surveillance system. So what has this got to do with the modern workplace? Well, think maybe the last time you phoned up about your Sky television subscription, or to increase your holiday insurance or to speak to the Open University of the other week. And you hear the words, this call may be monitored for training purposes. Why? Why do we monitor the people that make the cheap mistakes at the bottom of the pile? When was the last time you phoned the, the fine solicitors you mentioned, your photograph there, or a lawyer, or a top banker, and heard the words, this call may be monitored for training purposes? Why do we monitor the cheap sweets at the bottom, not the people at the top? So we have this, of course, ever-evolving workplace. And we've moved on massively since then. We speak about the exponential growth in the rate of change. You see my book for a second. And this was an award-winning, REBA award-winning workplace. And it was still in 2016. And it said, this space provides innovative interior design with space-efficient furniture configurations. 
The solution includes workstations that are re-engineered to integrate the technology, reduce costs, and accommodate a specific team size. So that is a brand new modern workspace. <coughs> Massively different to that, though, is it? Which is a workspace from 1906. And now, if we hear from writers Crompton and Jones describing this space, it's very interesting to see how it applies to modern workspace. Now, bear in mind we're talking about this space specifically, but see how it applies. We have huh, the early bullpen offices, which is what they're called, were noticeable for the per first appearance of tailorized space. They facilitated visual supervision and hierarchical use and control of the workspace. On the periphery of the building and around the central pool were the managers and supervisors' offices. Only managers retained a door for privacy and a window for ventilation. While the pool workers were increasingly reliant on the mechanical delivery of the ambient environment. So as psychologists, we hear about all these changes in the workplace and we go, well, we don't really see it. And in fact, the modern workspace now, with its flat screens, with its free address workstation, people can work to work, is exactly what's going on there. But this is the University of Oxford. You are destined for far better things. You are not one of the over-monitored, over-managed majority. You are one of these people, the privileged, self-directed few who won't have their phone calls monitored, who will work in lovely places because this kind of thing applies. This is Dilbert, who doesn't know Dilbert. I'm sure you can all read that and bury me to read it out for you. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a lovely quote. And you will work in places like this. This is Red Bull in London, where you don't have to take the slide. You can whip down... Sorry, you don't have to take the stairs. You can whip down on carbon fibre slides. Maybe not in a skirt, but you can. If you work in the Google Plex, you can go along corridors on little sort of scuddy machines that will take you a long way down the corridors. And this is... We work with the bar football. Now, again, as psychologists, we look at these places and we think, when did 15-year-old boys start to develop workspaces? <laughs> It's particularly interesting because the design industry is a very good gender split. But we're developing almost always a space like that. Why? But even more ubiquitous is the Lean Office, based on Lean Six Sigma. Does everybody not know what Lean Six Sigma is? I know it's a business school. OK. It's, it's, Lean Six Sigma are principles based on reducing waste and reducing error, essentially. So you want something that is stark. So all people do when they go into the job is the job. They're not distracted by fine pictures or plants or souvenirs from holidays or hot drinks. They just have the job to do. Even in brilliant locations of great companies like this, Lean Six Sigma is becoming fairly ubiquitous. 70% of companies now have a lean system. And they do it for measurement. And I collect answers. I'll go, how do you measure productivity? And people tell me. And there's one particular thing that I would like to point out, the second one down. It is impossible, impossible to measure productivity by questionnaire. Allow me to demonstrate. You raise your hand, please, if you are a less than average driver. <laughs> Anybody here a less than average lover? That's just me, then. <laughs> and what about if you are less productive than your peers? OK, so 50% of us are wrong on all of those things. Because it's just like driving a car. You can tell how comfortable a car is by asking somebody. If you want to know how it performs, you need a quantitative measure. And as a quick example of that, call centres are measured to death. If you make a 999 call to very many places, you're timed on how quickly you pick up the phone call, how quickly you deal with the phone call, and how you handle the paperwork associated with that phone call. I'm going to swear, so if you don't like swearing, it's your time. So the very most productive phone call is you pick up the phone straight away, you say, fuck off, and you put the phone down again. And calls keep coming all the time. There's no paperwork associated. So even in these situations, it's really hard to measure productivity. So we make sure that we can. And this is how we do it. Right? This is how we did it for a very large, big four consultancy that I can't name, but was on the same slide that Alex put up earlier on. Right? We gave them a pile of memoranda. And we said, put them in date order, and then answer some questions. And you can't answer those questions in general knowledge. Information processing, information management. We then gave them an A4 magazine article, and you use this in 1906, with an Oxford Don on it. Okay? And we said, would you please go through this 
and cross out every lowercase letter B that you can find. And on both of those things, we're looking for speed, how quickly they do the questionnaire, how quickly they find those letters B, and accuracy, how many they find, how fast they do it. And we measure it. And we measure it across different office design, different workplaces. We use it with teams these days, but I think just doing it individually in this space shows the point reasonably well. Tim here, Jim W. Tim here is sitting in a beautiful, lean space. Has nothing to distract him, no nasty pictures that are going to distract him from his job. He's sitting at a comfortable desk, on a comfortable chair, doing the job as well he can. We ruin Pamela's workspace by putting all those nasty pictures and plants about it. Maya comes in and we said, this is your space. You decorate it as you would like to. And then the fourth condition, some swine came in having been told they could decorate the space. Some horrible person comes in and me mess it all about. Madam, may I, may I experiment on you for a moment, Sasha? Would you mind? So Sasha comes in, she, she sort of sits down. You have your workspace, and I'll go, sorry, Sasha, no. No, bag's got to go. That's not in that. Um, uh, you're going to spill that. And that's on that side, OK? And then we get on with the task. Did, did that feel nice? No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Because what happens is quite a lot of the time people give authority and take it away and we wanted to simulate it. And so we look at it in terms of productivity. Okay? So, in the lean condition where Tim was, the lean Six Sigma space when we do this all the time, those two tasks, the letters, the letters B task and the memo task, took an average of 40 minutes and 30 seconds. We put in pictures and plants and they were doing it seven minutes faster. When we said, this is your space, do it yourself, 32% faster. And then a tumble back again in the compromised condition. And we think it's worse than that in real life because some people go, well, it's an experiment, you mucked around, I didn't mind what you did. Can I ask a quick question? Yes? I'm curious with this, do you measure them like after a year? Like once they're used to the space, do you keep measuring? We have done longitudinal stuff as well. Yeah, yes, it's, it's consistent. Yeah. So we then look at this and this 32% increase, whatever it is, and we say, well, how many more errors are you going to make? Because you're going to work 32% faster, you're bound to make more mistakes. So is it worth being a careful, Carol, steady Eddie? Or do you want people to work a bit faster and make a few more, a few more errors? When you look at the data, they show us that people make fewer or the same number of errors. Now, letting people choose pictures and plants gives them a huge fillip and gives the company a huge fillip in terms of how people feel and how they perform and how they engage with what's going on. Right? So we can conclude that you know, enrichment, empowerment increases productivity, and there are no decrements in errors. So I want to show you, yes, I've got time, two quick videos. Because business is quite good at, at working itself through problems, but it tends to disregard what goes on outside the business bubble. We work very closely with older adults in care, and we took some of the business work into the older adults' world, and then we extended it a little bit. So I'm going to show you now a project we did with the BBC and how giving people a choice in their space and letting them influence the design of that space had interesting effects. So the first burst, a quick five-minute video. Our final experiment puts the power of taking control to the test. Research has suggested that the amount of control we have over our lives has a direct influence on life expectancy. When older residents move into care, there's a very strong correlation, an inverse correlation, between their length of stay and how happy they are. And that's not because they're not very well cared for, often they're extremely well cared for. We believe that it's got a lot to do with how empowered they feel. I'm looking over a four-leaf clover. In this wing of a progressive care home in Somerset, there are eight residents ranging from 77 to 96 years old. They're already offered many choices in their day-to-day -day lives, but today the reins are going to be transferred entirely into their hands. They've agreed to participate in a research study run by three psychologists from Exeter University, in which they'll be asked to make all the decisions about the redesign of their communal lounge. The psychologists hope that by increasing the control they have over the lounge and encouraging them to spend more time together in it, they will experience an increase in brain function and well-being. What's today's date? The psychologists
psychologists will test memory, language, and attention skills before the makeover and repeat the same test two weeks later. Do you know the name of the current Prime Minister? <laughs> well, I know it, but... Uh, uh, that, that, that big-headed fella, don't they call him? Um, oh, what's his name? Now, do you know the name of the man who is US President at the moment? President Kennedy. What we found in some other studies of this type is that interventions of the form that we're seeing here can actually enhance people's alertness. They're more engaged, they're more capable of engaging, and they're living richer, fuller lives. When you're my age, nothing exciting happens very much. So you've got to go out and find it. And here it is, come to me doll, lovely. <laughs> it is quite a surprise to find myself on Teddy, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to have a laugh, haven't you? <laughs> Hi, everyone. The residents get cracking on the redesign. They must choose a paint colour for one of the walls. I think that's too light. You would have it more. <laughs> I'm not keen on the red at all. No, I'm not keen on the red. The favourite colours were that, yeah? And that. How about the yellow as well? Yeah. Well, let's have a look at the yellow. I don't like the yellow at all. They must also choose pictures and plants to redecorate the room. Tall one. The tall yeah, one. one. This yeah. one here. Yes, okay. I think so. Uh, Michelle. What do you think? Do you think it works? Very nice. I think those two would be nice. They would be nice against the main green plant. It's not too bad, is it? It was a good choice of yours then, don't you think? There you go. Here we are, have a look. Yes, it's very nice, isn't it? It's pretty good, I think. I think you did it's a really nice good job. Indeed. It's beautiful, I think. Oh, nice. Oh, it's very yes, nice. I like it. It's very nice. I think it? it's very nice, Michelle. Uh, it's lovely. It's wonderful. It's that it looks lovely there, doesn't yes. it? Beautiful. But will the freedom to make their own choices actually have a scientifically measurable effect? So the test you saw those people do was something called the Addenbrooke's Cognitive Exam Revised, the ASR, and it's used to test for dementia, early signs of dementia. So it's a fairly significant thing we're looking to improve scores on. The next two minutes, we'll just show you what happened. In the two weeks since the makeover, the psychologist logs have revealed that the residents are spending three times as long socialising in their newly decorated lounge. But has empowering the residents and encouraging them to socialise had any effect on their brain function? What is the day of the week? I was wondering whether you could tell me Today, what day. It's Tuesday, the 29th of June. Perfect. Can you tell me the name of the current Prime Minister? Cameron. Yes. Can you spell the word world for me? W-R-W-O-R-L-D. That's correct. A little bit more difficult. Can yes. you spell it backwards? D-O-R-O-W. Oh, very good. In just two weeks, the average test scores improved by a remarkable 19%. The psychologists want to brief the staff at the home on the results. I think the really interesting result was that we saw an improvement in their attention and in their memory. And I think by empowering people to make those decisions, it increased their motivation. If you had a drug that could give a 19% improvement in people's memory and alertness, you couldn't put a price on it. And yet the big drug the big drug that's out there is other people, is social yeah. engagement. And I, and I just don't think that message gets across enough. The most important thing is to let the residents be engaged in any changes or anything to do with their home. Because at the end of the day, we're visiting their home. And we should respect it's their home. Giving the residents just simple decisions to make has offered them a new lease of life. Knowing that that's happening is much, uh, very much a stimulation within us for to want to keep going and yeah. to go even better. You get it of thinking, 
I'm getting up, I'm going in there, something might happen to this. Whoopee. Yeah, brilliant. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what we've done is used art and plants in a way that empowers people by letting the older adults inform the design processes going on. And something that you might like to know now is what's coming out about what makes a good picture in a, in a workplace and what makes a, a poor picture in a workplace. This is an appalling workplace. There is no excuse for this workplace at all. It is entirely and utterly toxic. Utterly toxic. There is no animal in the world that thrives in a lean environment. Whether it's an ant in a lean jam jar or a gorilla in a lean zoo, we are no different. That is awful. You can do this, and you can put company banners across the top. That's as bad. It makes no difference. People do not respond to that. Or you can have these fabulous motivational posters. And they don't work either. People generally tend to know why they're at work. They know who they work for. They know it's the second biggest insurance company in the country. They don't need telling. These work. This is, I think, from your website. I'll pinch this. This is you know, just some pictures of athletes and things just to get people engaged. This works. Putting people in, you saw this earlier on, just making it enrich. It's what we're doing. We're enriching your workspace. This is the best thing of all, where you get people engaged in doing it themselves. But this is where I come down to being a Philistine. Quantity is important. If that is worth a fortune in terms of money, it doesn't work quite as well as all those there. Quantity is important. You need to be able to see and be surrounded by the artwork. And what we're doing here, and I'm going to come to the end quite quickly now, is at the moment there is a battle for world best practice between the lean, Six Sigma, the no waste, no error, and the enriched Google Red Bull space. By letting people develop their own space, we leave those standing. You saw that with a 32% increase. By re-engaging design, which is what the red circle is doing, we're getting it to go even further. That's the stuff that we've taken the old adults in care. So the idea is identity to realisation. Because if you go into a space and you realise your own identity, you can see bits of you, that's what makes a good space. And if we then plus it by putting a designer in the mix, we get some quite extraordinary things. And I'll just show you creativity here. I'll fly through this fairly quickly. We can talk about it later if you'd like. We ask people to think of fairly simple creativity to ask, how many things can you think of to do with this water bottle in 90 seconds? Okay? And people think of just over seven in the lean space to going up to ten and a half when you let them have a say in what's going on in designing the space. Then I'll flick on a little bit. Group intellectual performance. How long does it take people to complete a task? 20.5% increase across the piece. Which is quite interesting, bearing in mind we're now in a university. Because this is a fairly enriched space. It's nice, it's wood, it's groovy, if you like, it's quite good. But we could almost certainly improve it. And when we can improve spaces like this, we now have evidence you will be cleverer and will perform better. And you'll make fewer errors. Look. So these are fairly seismic data in some ways. That's a bit of an increase. And we have this causal, and again, I stress causal data. About a good space has good design, but it also needs people to be trusted in terms of autonomy, and they need to have a say in what's going on. They need decisional input. That generates a sense of comfort in the workplace, psychological comfort, which has nothing to do with wood and with leather, but with feeling at home, that sense of ambience. That you then have congruent identity. You not only work together as a group, because this here is the team that would decide how it would like to design its space, so they think, well, we're empowered, we feel good but they also like the company that trusts them to do it. And this congruent identity then leads to all good things, to a decrease in stress, increase in job satisfaction, decrease in staff turnover, increase in productivity, and now creativity and intelligence as well. It's a win-win picture. 70% of organisations have awful workspaces built in. We can improve those pretty much immediately. It's really simple science. Psychology has been out of tact recently, and quite rightly. 30%, only 30% of our studies in psychology are robust enough to stand scrutiny and keep coming back. This is part of that 30%. We can improve anything, and there's no loss to the business. So we find for them the best workspace. And we're continuing this now into 2020 by looking at larger businesses, getting ourselves through the door in different organisations who really want to improve not just their profit, but also 
the lives of people that work for them. Because it's an entirely virtuous circle. The happier companies, the companies where people feel more engaged, are the ones where they are more productive, more creative, and more effectively intelligent. Thank you. Craig, that was um, really fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in the old people's home example, which was which was amazing to watch. Um, if a group of new residents moved in and and replaced that current group, how empowered would they feel? Is it is it the fact that the group had an, a say in what what their place looks like, or is it more about uh, what the place looks like. Thank you for that. I, what I should have said, and I didn't, is there's a control condition going on in that study as well. You saw the 19% increase. There's a control condition with no increase. So thank you for raising that for that, for that point as well. Um, yes, what, what happens is when the new member joins again, they're shown this is our space, this is how we do it, is there anything you'd like to add? And what we find, and this is longitudinal now as well, is that people very seldom change the space. They don't do very much alteration. It's the fact that they can that makes a really big difference. So yeah, they just include new members of the group when they come in. Thank you so much, this was so interesting. And I wanted to pick up on the theme you mentioned about quantity, um, whether that's just like, if, if there in fact is a limit, because I could imagine even if I wanted a lot going on, I may <laughs> suddenly realize that the room is perhaps too busy for the analysis I need to run and I'm being too distracted by like my creative creativity run wild, say if I were decorating my office. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about whether there is a limit to quantity of creativity in those spaces. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I mentioned it briefly with our, our team there. What we do is we get people to work as groups when they develop their own space. So if you want a, a lush Amazon and, I don't know, we've got Joe here who said, I just want it stuck and I don't want anything, then you need to come to an agreement between you. Okay? Now, every time we've done this, I expect disaster and failure, especially with old adults in care. They were a nightmare to get to agree about anything, but they always do. We've yet to have a situation where we don't get a group coming to consensus. And when they come to consensus, they all buy into the space, generally speaking, or at least they've had the chance to buy into the space. So if I go, well, I don't care, you get on with it, at least I've had the chance. And that makes the difference. So that's how it controls itself, really, by having a group decision. Uh, yes? Thanks. Uh, just a follow-up question on that, uh, in terms of... Uh, how much, like how further the company or the office space would go to make it more attractive or dynamic would work? Is there a, like a uh, correlation with the more you do, the better result you got? Or there is like, some argument like for a, the co-work space for WeWork, some think it's brilliant, they should do more and some think they are overdoing it so people got too comfortable and distracted or... That is a lovely question. Thank you for that. Um, what we find... I'll just, I'll just flick it back a couple of slides. Is this doable? Just to this, to this one here. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You remember that you have the fight at the moment between the, 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 the Lean Six Sigma space and the, the, um, the enriched space. Okay? So what you've got... Oh, yeah, thank you very much. I, I'll drive it back from here. All I want to show you... No, that'll do. That'll do. Right. What we have here is this, this is where the fight for best practice lives. Okay? And the enriched space knocks lean into a cocktail. It just does. The, the, the Google space is far, far better than the Spain space. And the Google space looks lovely. When you design the space yourself, when your team or this team or this team develops their own space, then it tends to look horrible because there's no skill in design. You know, you have plastic palm trees and the colours don't match and it just doesn't work. It doesn't look like it works. But it's always at least as good and usually better. Never in 16 years of study has that identity realised space been worse than the one produced by the top designer. Never. So it's not a case of good looking, it's a case of buying into it and how it feels for the group. And the reason that we did this latter one, the stuff that we started the old arts in care, is it doesn't really make sense. If you, madam, are a fabulous designer and I am the oik I am, your space should beat mine every time. But it never does. 
So it's the issue is with what's called the design-led solution, which is promulgated as the thing to do, have a design-led solution. Mm, don't. What you need to do is lead the design. So this is a design-led. You want a lead design where the designer is submissive to you and submissive to the team, so then you reincorporate the skill, and then you get some phenomenal results. Uh, you've been very patient, Ed. Uh, does this mean that uh, people are more productive when they work from home? Why do you ask that? Well, well they're in the space that they've designed themselves, so in their um, living room, surrounded by maybe the works of art or whatever it is, the things that make them right. happy at home. Does that make them more productive? It depends, is the answer to that. If you're in one of these cells where you're very tightly controlled and you can't move, um, yes. But what's really important, the slide, this slide that I flew through and didn't show you, is that people will say that work is a thing that you do, not a place that you go to. And that was the Royal Institute of um, Charter Surveyors that said that. And it's utter rubbish. Utter, utter rubbish. Where we work is a fundamental tenet of our identity. So if you haven't got a place to go to work, if you're always working from home, no, it isn't. But, you, but it is better in says you can develop it yourself. But you need that... You have this concept of the office as a street where you meet people, as a village where it's a resource, and as a library where you learn stuff. You need somewhere to go. If you haven't got that, then you're missing something. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question is about have you tried to test the different industry? Because I think maybe in the meta industry or maybe in the manufacturing industry, maybe there are different things. Because, yeah, because in the industry, yeah. Top the, point. Yeah. Top point. The lean, lean that you saw before is said to have come from Japan, the Japanese manufacturing marvel of the 80s and 90s. And people copied the lean philosophy, called the Toyota's philosophy. And we have the five pillars of lean that came from Japan that were used in the offices, which are, well, I'll talk about that later, but it had these five guiding pillars that came from Japan. Right? Now, the point of those five pillars is they didn't come from Japan. They are beautifully explained in Taylor's book, The Guy with the, uh, the Steel Mill, <laughs> beautifully explained in his book published in 1911, The Principles of Scientific Management. Because what Toyota did is it copied Henry Ford, and Henry Ford worked with, with Frederick Taylor, or at the same time as Frederick Taylor, and those ideas filtered through. So, does it work differently in industry? I can't be sure, because the industry always bottled it when I've tried it. I, worked with, I was going to work with a very well-known manufacturer of uh, pasties that you may have heard of that I couldn't possibly mention, who also make apple pies. And I said, give me the apple pie room. They had three production lines for apple pies. This one here, let's keep it lean. Okay? And this one here, we'll just put pictures there. Because you don't want plants, you have central contamination. So just pictures on this one here. And this one here, we'll give to the workers. And they can run that as they see fit. Never mind Lean Six Sigma, they can run it, but you're not going to know what's going on. Because Kaizen, quality circles, all these things are about taking information from the shop floor and vesting it in management. You know, let's swap some ideas about the tapping thing, the catch ball, let's swap some ideas about how much management and stop when it's got all the ideas. So, no, you're not going to do that. Let them work it and keep the ideas. And I bet them that C was better than B was better than A. And we're going to do it in the bottle bit. So I can't answer that directly, but I suspect not, because we're all humans. And you're in richer space, when it just makes it better. So, so maybe in the future studies, we can add some moderated variables, such as the education. Maybe you have a high education background. You will have much um, possibility to perceive the art values. So I think the different people maybe have the different perceive of the art values is different. Yeah, I so I think maybe we can add some much more the moderate variable yeah. in the future. Yeah. Yeah, Thank I you so much. I think there's something in that. There's certainly something. Uh, we, we are different as people. But there are certain givens as well. Right? Uh, and one of the givens is that we like an enriched space. We just like any beast. It doesn't matter what it is, enriched work. But you are right. And one thing that's very interesting is how different cultures will respond to different levels of empowerment. For example, we've generally done this stuff in Western societies. You know, in Europe, we've done stuff in America, we've done stuff in Australasia. But we haven't done anything, for example, in, in Pod, where you come from very much. We touched in Japan, and that's it. But China, for example, has done nothing. And we'd love to see what that level of empowerment does in a very collective society to see what happens. That's a very fair point. You had a question, Matt. Uh, in one of the slides, you mentioned that what increases the productivity of senior management 
it decreases, like what increases the production of the junior uh, people, it decreases the productivity of yes, the, the Dilbert senior Dilbert. management. Let me get it. Okay. I'm always writing these things the wrong way. I'm dreadful with these. Here we go. Do you carry on with the question while I'm just driving this? So button. I just wanted to understand, like, is it true in all instances and what is the basis for this? That's the one you mean, isn't it? Is, yeah. is it true, did you say? Yeah. No, it's absolutely, of course not true. Utter rubbish. It's not true <laughs> in the slightest. It's just that what, what we tend to do, and I'm as guilty as anybody else, is we, you know, we are the few that are self-managed and we can go to conference when we like them. No, we're going to monitor our so called sod off. You're not going to do that. No, of course it's not true. We're all the same. But we think we're going to treat them like little sort of fleas. And we're going to monitor and make sure and keep, keep them in these spaces. Agile, for example, flexible workspaces, dates back to Josiah Wedgwood, who did it in the 18th century, because he could control the workers. So that Adam Smith, who was very right-wing, and Karl Marx, very left-wing, both agreed it was appalling. But Wedgwood did it anyway. Okay? Um, but it's the same for all. We all respond in the same way. We d we've done all of these studies you've seen with people at the top of organisations, in wealthy organisations, and really low-paid organisations. Identical. No difference at all. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm curious to know how it works when teams change. Like, for example, in the one where everyone's very involved in it. And let's say, like, you know, someone new joins the team, I join the team, and I haven't been involved with the creation of the space. And if it's not design-led, but it's, like, people-led, and I join and I feel, oh, to know that these people have great taste. How does that work with team turnover? Yeah. It, it's similar to the question the gentleman asked before, in as much as um, what happens is the team will incorporate you, or should incorporate you, into what's going on. Okay? And again, it's one of these things that, like, I don't expect the team to work every time we do it. I, I often expect people to just get frozen out. You know, I'm a new team member and it's business a team and it's not going to happen. And again, as yet, it hasn't happened and people have always been incorporated into the team. And the best example I can give you of that is Somerset Care, which is who we film with the BBC. And what we did there is we basically empowered, as you saw in the film, a first floor. And the first floor residents, unfortunately, turn over because they're old on a relatively regular basis. And still, what happens in the first floor is people wanted to go there. They attracted the buzz of the residents and people wanted to join that first floor community. Even though ground floor rooms are bigger, they have access to the outside world, you know, their patio doors, and there are no stairs to bother with. To the extent that Somerset Care were able to charge the same for a, not for a first floor room as for a ground floor room, when normally there's a 10% difference, if that helps. Sorry, one last question, and then... Okay. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you talked about productivity, but does that affect everyone in the same pace? And, for example, does age uh, have a difference to that? No, it doesn't affect everyone in the same way. No, not at all. And that's why, to go back to the thing where you have the enriched space and the lean space, enriched is always better, generally. Because some people like a spartan, clean space. And if you choose that space, that's what you want to work in, that is every bit as productive surrounding yourself with you know, the works of Leonardo da Vinci and the Amazon rainforest. Every bit as productive because you've chosen it. Which is why when you let people choose, you have that, that further leap. So yeah, people are, people are different in what they choose. So we're looking at mo uh, entirely general with enriched and then general incorporating specific when we look at the identity realized space, if that helps. 